Hi, I'm Rosie Acosta. I'm a meditation teacher, speaker, and author of You Are Radically Loved, a healing journey to self-love. Look, I grew up in East Los Angeles during the 92 LA riots, and it set me on a troubled path. I didn't grow up with mentors in my life, so I turned to reading as many books as I possibly could to learn about the purpose of life. In my journey, I found that having these conversations gave me life, and I decided I wanted to create a place where I could share these conversations with my community. So come have a sit with me as we learn about, well, everything. Hello, everyone. I am so excited to be hosting this very special episode of Radically Love today on behalf of Rosie, who is over at Headspace recording some amazing content. And we have a very special, as I just mentioned, guest, Tara Schuster. She's the author of Buy Yourself the Fucking Lilies, which is, first of all, such an epic name. And I have been loving the book. So thank you, Tara, for writing it. And um, you also have another book coming out in February, Glow in the Fucking Dark, which has probably already been written. And, and now I'm sure you're in the process of editing and making this baby be birthed into the world. Um, and then for those of you who are familiar with Tara's work, she was the former vice president of talent and development at Comedy Central, now turned. Is it mental? You're working in, in the mental health realm? Yeah, what we say is, first off, um, yeah, Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you for saying anything nice at all about Lily's. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Um, and yeah, I feel like my role now, I had this whole life in entertainment, you know, and I was at Comedy Central for like fully a third of my life, you know, it was very much embedded in my DNA. And once Lily's came out, I realized I had this opportunity to become a real mental health advocate because I have really been there. I've also, you know, had a full-time job, like re like lived in the real world, not as an academic, not as an expert. Those things are really important to have the, you know, the bigger theories and, and extremely important. But in terms of like, how do we practically take care of our mental health and sanity? Um, that's what I love to work within is finding tangible solutions that break down these bigger concepts into stuff we can do for free today. And so that's where the bulk of my work is. Um, and I also just like telling stories. So, you know, when you buy, buy yourself the fucking lilies or glow in the fucking dark, and I think you, Tessa, can probably um, vouch for this, like it's stories. Mm -hmm. It's not prescriptive self-help. Yes, I break things down for you. But really what I'm interested in is being a writer and entertaining you, taking you on a journey, um, making sure you want to get to the next page. So yeah, mental health advocate, um, author, very privileged to, to be able to say those are two things I now do. Yeah. And it, it's a, you, you're right. I, so there's a couple of things about the book and, and the first book I'm referring to is by yourself, the fucking lilies, um, which I've, Fucking love the title. Sorry for all <laughs> the F-bombs, y'all, but it's just a great title. And I think I want to start there having you tell me about the title. I have a guess as to where it comes from. There's a chapter in the book dedicated yes. to this. <laughs> yes. But I'd like to hear in your words this. Tell me about this title. Yeah. Well, I'll give you a little context if you haven't read the book, kind of even what, what it's about or where I'm coming from with all this. Um I grew up in a neglectful, psychologically abusive house where things came to die. All the pets, all the plants, uh, the love, the little love that was there. Nothing could survive because nothing was nourished. Uh, luckily, my sister and I made it out, um, but we didn't make it out without a lot of wounding. And, you know, what that led to was severe anxiety and depression, suicidal ideation, because if I if I boiled it down, the message I left my childhood with is you are worthless. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, one phrase, you are worthless. Um, you know, because that's the story you make up as a child. Why else would people be treating you the way they're treating you if it's not 
that you're just not worthwhile in any kind of way. And so I really looked for external validation to fill in for my parents, which meant, you know, I was always teacher's pet. I was uh, like so dedicated to school, which got me out of my situation to geographically the furthest you could be from LA, uh, which is Providence, Rhode Island, where, you know, I went to an Ivy League school and immediately got a job at Comedy Central and was like, climbing the ranks really quickly because that's all I had was the external world. And I might've kept hustling this way had I not hit rock bottom on my 25th birthday when I drunk dialed my therapist and the next morning in listening to her um, increasingly worried voicemails realized, oh, I left a message threatening to kill myself, which you know, not ideal. It's not an ideal voicemail to be leaving. And I really had to get real that I had no parents, no secret parents were coming to rescue me. Nobody was going to nurture me. I was the only one who was going to do it. And so getting back to your original question, you know, what is why the title? I basically just experimented with, you know, I, I read a lot. I did a lot of research. Reparenting wasn't really a term when I began. Um, it was like a term of convenience because I was like, what is it that I'm doing even, you know, and it's becoming my own parent. Um, and so one of the things was I would go to Trader Joe's and I would see lilies, which are my absolute favorite flower in the world. You know, they just, they're so elegant. And when they burst open, it's like this scent that if you have a studio apartment, you could just fill the whole thing with, with one small bouquet of lilies. Uh, so I'd see them, I'd want them. And then I would think I'm not worth it. I'm not worthwhile. Those are just going to die. If I buy those, they're $6. It's, you know, going to be step one in step 10 of uh, financial ruin. No, no, no. I'm not worth it. I'm not worth it. And through the work that I did in reparenting myself, I realized, wait, I am worth the lilies. I am at a minimum worth $6. I am worth doing the thing that will instantly make my whole life a little better. I'm treating myself as not a wild luxury, but is in fact a, a way to honor yourself. And so that's how the title came to be. Yeah, thank you. So I, um, full disclosure, let me get, there's so many different directions my brain's going right now because you said a lot of things that I wanted to touch on. And yeah. so, yes, I agree with you that this book is written in story and it's very easy to read. It's very accessible. I love how practical it is because let me tell you, Rosie and I both have read, I feel like all the self-help books in the world as a benefit, as a perk of this job, we get all these amazing books sent to us. But yours, Tara, for me, it spoke to me in a different way. I've told Rosie this before. I have a little bit of resistance to reading self-help. I'll get oh, yeah. to like the introduction where there is a story about the person that that this work is grounded in. And then when they start giving me lists of things to do, it's like I'll put it away on the shelf and I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm burnt out on this working yeah. on myself. But I love the practicality of the list. I mean, all these things are free. They're accessible. I can do them. I, I, I do some of them already, but I don't, it's, it's like the context of putting it in this reparenting kind of like you mentioned. Right. And so that's one aspect I wanted to touch on. And it's almost like the, the way that you're writing this is I feel like it's how I think and talk to myself. So it's mm. so accessible to so many of us, like the all caps and the expletives <laughs> and the explanation points. I just love it. Um, the one phrase I keep coming back to, it's on page 51. And when you started to talk about your origin story, you know, growing up in this household uh, where everything went to die and that the little love you said that was present and you and your sister made it out of there alive brings me back to the sentence over and over again, which is the trauma and the gratitude were able to live in the same space together. Yeah. And I just find that to be so, I think about this in terms of the the macro life itself, right? That tragedy, that beauty that exists, that terrifying, thrilling, 
existence of life itself is that statement embodied. Um, and you're speaking about this here in terms of a uh, another practical tip that you give us, which is gratitude. Right. And so will you tell me a little bit more about your, well, all of us, those of those of us who haven't picked up the book yet, um, or maybe they have and just need a reminder, what is this gratitude process like for you? Yeah. So, you know, I did not grow up grateful. If anything, I was anti-grateful because when you grow up in a household as chaotic, disordered, emotionally abusive as mine, you don't really feel like you have a lot to be grateful for. And so that's the position I started with. Um, I was miserable. I felt like I had nothing to be grateful for. And as fate would have it, you know, this is the beginning of my reparenting journey. And I, I was just trying on anything and like any advice I heard that I thought might be helpful. Cause I was just desperate, like straight up, urgent, desperate. I don't want to die. That's why I did everything with such zeal. Um, but you know, you, you bring up just a sidebar, you bring up something about self-help, which is I didn't read self-help books. Mm -hmm. I wasn't even aware that that was really a, a genre. And I was so repelled by that and thought it was so like weak, you know, like, you know, Oh, I've heard of self-help. That sounds for like stupid people who like need, need more help or whatever. So that's like really where I began. And what I read as self-help was, uh, Nora Ephron's memoir, Steve Martin's memoir. I read the books of adults, I really admired. And then I tried to do what they did. Mm -hmm. So I was coming at it. And that's, I think, why it's so storytelling based is because that's the world I was coming from. And that's how I how I like to take in self-help. But anyway, I'm in this reparenting journey. One of the very first things that was uh, suggested to me was gratitude. Um, and it was because I was at a very waspy friends, quote unquote, compound in Maine. Um, you know, like she was the type of waspy that her whole family came to America on the Arabella, which if you don't know what that is, which I didn't, was the second boat after the Mayflower that brought John Winthrop to his city upon a hill. You know, they were just like blue blood. Uh, I am not. I'm super liberal, super Jewish, like, you know, dropping F-bombs everywhere. And so I get to their house. I'm in a terrible mood. And my friend who invited me, Isabel, her cousin comes, cousin Eliza, who went to Harvard, is blonde, beautiful, delicate features. She had gone to Harvard, was a ballerina, like a professional ballerina, who then just one day decided to be a lawyer. You know, she's like one of those people you like immediately hate and then you hate them even more because she's really nice. You know, and they, you want her to suck, but she doesn't. Um, and she suggested to me, she was like, well, why don't you try a gratitude practice? And I was like, fuck you. You know, like my whole being was boiling with hatred because I was like, you are so privileged. You don't even understand. You have a compound. I don't have anywhere to go for the holidays. Like, of course, you're happy and have a lot to be grateful for. Duh. Um, but because I was in a, a bad place, I decided, okay, I'll try a gratitude practice. And so every day I wrote down 10 things I was grateful for. And I really have to stress that I began in a place of I was not grateful for anything. In fact, my journals from that time say things like, you're such a liar. You're not grateful for anything. Like, what's wrong with you? They're very critical and acknowledging that the, I just didn't feel that way. Um, but as I started with just even the physical things like espresso, water, clean sheets, and moved on to, you know, friendships, my sister, my health. Oh my God, my health. Like I have been taking my health for granted my whole life. I'm so lucky that I'm healthy. And I began to realize, shit, I have a lot to be grateful for you know, and it was, and it, it wasn't to negate the trauma. It's not saying it's not toxic positivity. It's not saying, 
well, everything has a silver lining. And, you know, and so it all happened for a reason. No, it didn't happen for a reason. I'd much prefer that I didn't have books to write about this topic. And it happened. It it happened. I can't change that. I can change all my reactions to it. And I'm on this beautiful journey meeting people like you. And I get to write in it the way I want to. So you're not negate by finding gratitude, you're just opening the aperture on how you see your life mm -hmm. and including more of the reality, which is things are obviously not black and white. We want them to be, they're not. And one way that we know that we are maturing and maybe um, coming to more stable ground is when we can see the big picture, see the gratitude, see the traumatic things. And now, you know, I have less of an allergic reaction to self-help because I realize, wow, how powerful when people want to change themselves and by whatever means necessary, you know, it is only a reflection of our society that helping yourself and helping yourself to heal is looked down upon by some. Like, that's crazy. Like, you're the hero that in this muck and chaos and mess, you're like, wait, hold on a second. I am worthwhile. I deserve to be stable. Like, at a minimum, let me put in the work. Um, And so that is a total ramble of <laughs> gratitude and how I'm a convert to self-help. Yeah, no, I love that. And it's really helpful too, I think, because yeah, I can sit here and say, and you know, by the way, Rosie's totally different than me in terms of her approach to reading self-help books because she'll just kind of fly through them. Whereas I feel like I'm the one that has the aversion sometimes. And what is that? It says more about me than it does about about self-help or anyone that reads self-help books. Totally. Right. So I, I think that's important to point out that everything that you said about self-help is valid. And what a wonderful thing to realize. I have the power to change myself. Yeah. That's, that's a tremendous ability that we have as human beings to improve and to get better and to heal. So I love that. Thank you for saying that. I tend to forget how cold it actually gets in LA. Typically, it takes a few weeks into winter for us to get a really deep cold snap. Why am I talking about this? Oh yes, because I get to wear all of my layers, which brings me to my favorites from Faraday Brand. Faraday is passionate about craftsmanship, comfort, and sustainability. Their ongoing partnership with Native designers supports Native communities while helping end appropriation in fashion. Every piece is designed to be a lifetime favorite, and if anything happens, happens along the way, Faraday will replace or fix your clothes for life, no matter what. Check out the Mickey collection. The Mickey Henley sweater is my current favorite. I have to admit, I have it in five different colors because I'm the type of person, once I like something, I want to make sure that I can wear it for a really long time. But for a limited time, Faraday is giving all of our Radically Loved listeners an amazing deal. 20% off of your order. All you have to do is head over to faritybrand.com forward slash Rosie and use the code Rosie at checkout to get this deal. That's code R-O-S-I-E at Faraday, F-A-H-E-R-T-Y brand.com forward slash Rosie for 20% off faritybrand.com forward slash Rosie. Or you can check the link in the info button of this particular podcast. So I feel so inspired by this section in the book where you provide this recipe for thank you cards. Mm, mm -hmm. It feels like a lost art, right? To to like go to a stationery store and pick out something that draws your eye, pick up a pen, <laughs> open yeah. the card, write, write down something that you're truly thinking and feeling about this person that you're writing the thank you card for. So I really love that chapter. It's dog-eared bookmarked like everything else in this book. And I'd love it if you'd talk a little bit about it. Yeah. So right alongside, you know, picking up a gratitude practice, I realized for me, nothing works if it's just in my head. If it's just some like theory that I'm pondering and I don't know how to put it into practice in the real world, it, it falls flat for me. And so what I realized with thank you cards is this is a physical way to put my gratitude into the world, to remind myself of 
the bigger picture and to hopefully remind my friends of how loved they are by me. And, and so I never wrote uh, thank you cards growing up. So if you gave me a gift at my, you know, uh, first grade birthday party, like, I'm so sorry. Great. Like from kindergarten to college, you never received a thank you note. And I deeply apologize for that. Um, but like, it, just, it I didn't have practice and my parents didn't write them. So I had no idea what to say in the thank you cards. So I broke it down into a recipe for how I, you know, give thanks um, to people. And it's much more based on, you know, in the book I have, it's, you begin with a, you begin by finding stationery that um, speaks to you, like you mentioned, because think of it as like a little present or a little treat, both for you and the recipient, because I think a lot of us uh, know the delight of seeing some really beautiful stationery and that moment of just like, oh, that's so nice, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, opening it up with um, a heartfelt, you know, hello to the person. And without getting into all the steps, the main one is to thank the person, not just for the object they've given you, or if they took you to dinner, it's not just for that. It's thanking them for more of the experience you have shared with them, whether it be that individual moment or a longer um, context of your friendship, your relationship, because we so rarely tell people how grateful we are just to have crossed paths with them. And so it's a really good opportunity for both you to remember that you're held in like a beloved web of relationships, you know, and for the recipient to remember that as well. Um, I call it Xanax for your soul. <laughs> and truly a lot of readers, they would agree that when you're in a horrible mood, you down and like, uh, you know, spinning narratives that are very negative in your head. One way to interrupt that whole process is just write a thank you card, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I can attest to that. I went out after I read that chapter, I think it was the next day and uh, <laughs> went to the stationery store and I bought myself two different boxes. Of oh, cards. yay. <laughs> I, that's great. like, so I feel like my my work on earth is done when people <laughs> take up thank you card writing. Yeah. So thank you for that. I love the recipe yeah. as well. Um, it's true. I think we can kind of, at least for me, I'm like, okay, well, I know I want to say thank you, but I don't want this to, to fall flat. I don't want it to feel contrived. I want this to be genuine. So yeah. I love that. I want to circle back to the money conversation mm. and you know, this is a good example for me because, you know, I read something in a book, there's this suggestion, okay, well, you could go buy this thing. And we started out talking about um, uh, the chapter, don't, don't cheap out on yourself, buy yourself the mm -hmm. fucking lilies. Mm -hmm. And at least for me personally, it can be really easy to slip into a spiral of, well, I'm going to celebrate myself every day and then my finances can spin out of control. Yeah. Um, so how do we stop that from happening? Yeah, it's um, it's funny because I'm basically saying two messages. They're a, li they're a little different. You know, the, the first, I'll begin with what I define self-care as, which is an honest accounting of your emotional state and bringing healing to any wounds that you have. That is self-care to me. Things like, um, you know, taking a luxury vacation to Hawaii, getting a facial, uh, a blowout party you're going to throw for yourself. A celebration, like on that scale, nice, really nice. In no way, shape or form self-care. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's discerning the difference between those things. Maybe I'd call that more self-celebration, seizing the moment, finding a victory. So it's, it's a lot of great things and it's not self-care. And so where the lilies come in is I think there's a little bit of a gray space where there are very basics that you could be treating as luxuries so that your every day is just baked in with beautiful things that bring you a smile, you know, so other versions of lilies for me would be um, socks without holes. Every day going into my closet and having socks without holes so that like I can just be flashy as fuck at TSA, you know, that 
makes me so happy. And it's a very basic thing. I'm thinking of, I always have a glass of water by my bed that's in a really pretty little cup. Wow. Every single day I get to look at this metallic gold cup that has these little etchings of turtles on it. It's it's a very small, basic luxury. And you're not saying, and this is my whole self-care practice is buying myself stuff. It's not all buying yourself the lilies, but the two definitely work together because if you want to raise the level of contentment in your whole life, like across the board, change the details, change the daily details that you do over and over and over again, because that's ultimately going to have a way bigger effect than the one time vacation, the facial where you spent a couple hundred dollars. Like it's just, uh, there's a quote and I'm forgetting what the author is, but it's something like, um, our lives are made up of the details, you know, something so obvious, but until you kind of think like, huh, yeah. Okay. I see that. Um, it can pass you by. Yeah. I used to have this argument with my partner when we were young, recent college grads having graduated and moved to a new city in 2009. Mm, good year. <laughs> yeah. Right. <It> was so <laughs> perfect. Moved to this new city without jobs, mind you, right. sign the lease. <laughs> and so I landed a job first and I remember Um, going to work every day. And my little detail that brought me pleasure was buying myself a a cup of coffee. And it was, it was a bit of a luxury because we were rather, I wouldn't say poor, but we, we were making ends meet, but you know, we were kind of really watching every dollar we spent. And so my partner would go back and forth. We would go back and forth about, okay, well, is this the one thing, this cup of coffee worth it? Because his argument would be, well, guess how much that adds up to every week? Guess how much that adds up to every month? And I would say, guess what I'm doing with my daily existence? And it's worth it for me to have this little luxury that brings me joy every day. I I think we're probably about the same age because I too left college into the recession with no job. And at that time, I would have had the the mindset of, I need to slash my way to the bottom. Mm -hmm. Anything that is excessive is a waste. And again, as you, you know, take on this work of self-care, things become a lot more yes and gray Mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. And what I would say to that um, is millennials in particular have been told that it's the avocado toast is the reason we can't buy a house. And it's insane. No, the reason we can't buy a house is because the economy in America favors the generationally wealthy, keeps them in power. Somebody who's had um, a stock portfolio with compounding interest for 50 years, they can afford to compound in Maine. Me saving that, you know, what, like if even if it's $4 a day, what you're like 20 bucks a week for coffee at work, Mm -hmm. they said, what? Okay, great. Like what actually were you going to buy that was more useful? And it's focusing on the, I write a lot about money Mm -hmm. and it is such a messed up way to think because to your point, what else did that coffee buy you? Did it buy you the ability to work a little harder that day? Did it buy you the ability to feel like you really were treating yourself and you weren't operating from such a scarcity mindset? What's that worth? You know, so, you know, at the same time, to the point you brought up previously, we cannot spend our way to self-care. You know, if we could, I would have done that long ago. Trust me. I love to shop. (laughs) I think I would have nailed that. But it's just not the case. And so again, it's, you know, finding the balance and also deprogramming ourselves a little, particularly around this money thing about small luxuries. We were all made to feel really bad and wasteful for having that cup of coffee. You know, that latte is putting you behind. I I really question um, the validity of that, both on a factual level and on a psychological level. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for helping me unpack yeah. that. That's, that's one argument that seems to come up again and again uh, throughout the decades mm. that just never sat with me. And I felt like, how do I explain this? 
yeah. thing that to me, it feels like it speaks to my ability to, to take care of myself, self-care yeah. and that I'm valuable enough that I can do that. And I deserve it. Totally. You know, and why else are you working so hard? Exactly. Like, what are you even doing? And you're not, I love you already. You are not going to save up to buy a house by skipping coffees. It, it's just not possible. So what would, what else would you have done with the money? And my, my question to anyone struggling with this is what else is it buying you? Mm-hmm. Have you considered, you know, what we were just talking about that it boosts your self-esteem, that you feel like you're taking care of yourself, that it makes something that might otherwise be treacherous, a lot more easy to deal with. And of course, it's a privileged thing to say, because Mm -hmm. I definitely have an extra $20 every week for sure. And if I didn't, I for sure, I absolutely couldn't say this. Mm -hmm. And I think there are a lot of people who are in my position who deny themselves small things, thinking it's going to make some difference in the big picture when it's just depriving yourself it's really nothing more than self-criticism yeah yeah do you struggle with brain fog or have difficulty focusing do you have trouble recalling names dates or where you left things if so i have some good news for you newtopia powered by bioptimizers has created a brand new one-of-a-kind product called collagenius It combines collagen, cocoa, and cacao with four different kinds of mushrooms, lion's mane, reishi, cordyceps, and chaga. This cutting edge blend fights brain fog, helps you repair your brain, improves your ability to focus, and boosts something called BDNF, which supports improved learning and memory power. After each serving of Collagenius, you'll feel calm, alert, and energized. Your ability to memorize and recall information will improve, and you'll get a hefty dose of antioxidants for your immunity support. Collagenius is delicious. It's sweetened with stevia and it tastes like rich chocolate elixir. Simply mix it with your water or milk and enjoy. Or for a more potent blend, you can mix it with your morning coffee to transform it into a delicious mood boosting mocha. But whatever you do, don't miss out on the brain boosting power of this amazing new product. For an exclusive offer for our Radically Loved listeners, go to newtopia.com forward slash Radically Loved Genius and use Radically Loved 10 during checkout to save 10% off and get free shipping. Again, that special link is newtopia.com forward slash Radically Loved Genius and use Radically Loved 10 during checkout to save 10% off and get free shipping. There's no risk to try it because you're protected by a 365 day full money back guarantee. So head over to newtopia.com forward slash Radically Loved Genius and use Radically Love 10 during checkout. You can also check the links and the promo code in the show notes. So I want to leave some time to discuss Glow in the Fucking Dark, which comes out, is it February 28th, 2023? February 28th. My baby, my second baby is going to be born. Can you talk a little bit about this book? The title, of course, I love it once again. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. And what is it about? Yeah. So if you read by yourself, the fucking lilies, that's a reaction to trauma. That book is how do you plug up the holes in a sinking ship, uh, burning sinking ship of complex trauma. That's what that book is about. And what is so surprising is that I did find stability. I had no emotional regulation. And when I look back, I was so self-critical that, I mean, self-criticism was all I had in my mind. It was just like this repeating diss track. I was treating my body really poorly. I It is not an overstatement to say I was truly miserable. Um, through the process of reparenting myself, I felt like a different person. You know, I didn't want to kill myself. I wanted to live my life. I had all of these tools that kept me sane and stable. And I felt like for the first time ever, I was on solid ground. And right as I got there, I was laid off by my job that had been my forever happy, like happily ever after job. You know, people at that point would introduce me as Tar Schuster, Comedy Central, like it was my married last name, you know, and I I hung so much of my self-worth on the status that that gave me and the, you know, what I believed to be purpose at that time. 
And once the job was taken out from under me and it was the beginning of the pandemic um, and I was single as fuck, living alone, no family in LA to be with ever, um, it was the most isolated, lonely I had ever been and I had no distractions. So my deepest traumas really just burst through. Um, And I think paradoxically, part of reason why these traumas burst through was because I actually was healthy enough to deal with them. Mm -hmm. They were things I had suppressed for so long. And so this whole book is about not letting your life be a reaction to things that happened to you, the past, and instead choosing who are you? What do you value? What do you want? Really getting in touch with yourself. I often um, gag at things like, be authentic, you know, and it's like written on a mug and big curly script. It's become cliche. And very few people know what's going on inside of themselves or what they actually want. They're stuck reacting, just in like a reactive spiral. And so this book is, you know, I researched philosophy, religion, trauma theory. I mean, I'm right now in an internal family systems class. Like my hobby is like learning more. I'm obviously not a therapist, nor do I want like leave that to the professionals. But I really tried to get informed about, well, how have other people found themselves? And that's what this book is, is trying on advice the same way I did in Lily's, but for a much deeper purpose. Mm, yeah, I can't wait to get my hands on that one. So I I want to ask you, um, well, like a million more questions, but I want to be mindful of your time. So let's come back to the ethos of Radically Loved. And I, um, Rosie generally asks this question at the end of each episode and the ethos of radically loved, if I could paraphrase, if I could try to paraphrase Rosie's word are um, that we are all radically loved by source, God, universe, whatever higher power you ascribe to. And sometimes she'll ask this as a two-part question. And those two parts are one, how do you feel radically loved? And two, what do you radically love? Mm, that's great. Um, well, I guess. So the title Glow in the Fucking Dark is about shining in bleak circumstances. And the central metaphor I use as to um, what is the number one thing to do to love yourself, to help yourself, it's to remind yourself that you are you are actually literally made of stardust. All of the uh, elements that make us up were born from stars we all have that same stuff inside. So we are inherently all connected, all belong to one another, all belong to whatever source, energy, lady God, as I call it. Wh- who, whatever made all this stuff, we are a part of and we are a part of each other. And so for me, that's really my source of feeling radically loved is that not only am I loved by that thing that chose to fill me up with stardust, but it also shines from all people. Even if, you know, in our day-to-day interactions, I'm in a fight, I'm in a this, I just try to recognize more and more that whatever shines in me is also shining from others towards me. Um, And that has been very powerful, especially because I don't really have parents to nurture me. This other thing does. Mm -hmm. And then what do I radically love? Um, you know, it's going to sound cheesy, but the readers of of By Yourself the Fucking Lilies, because the reason I wrote that book ultimately was I hoped to make one other person feel less alone. You know, that was, ask my editor, every step of the way, that was the goal. And what I didn't anticipate was that by reading my story, by telling me things like what you said, it feels like you're having a conversation or it's stuff that's already in your head. I felt less alone. I realized, oh, I'm not weird. This isn't an isolated situation. In fact, all of these people are DMing me. 
things much worse than what I went through, many shades better than I went through, but we're all on this continu continuum. And so you don't have to have had a, as traumatic a childhood as I did to have some holes that, that need to be filled in. And so I would say, I just love, 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 um, the people who've read the book and have made me feel like I'm less of a weirdo, you know? Yeah. Thank you. Well, I'm really glad you did write all of this down and that you do continue to write and do mental health advocacy work. It's important. Thank you. Especially, I, you know, there's so many, I mentioned this before, but I just can't underscore it enough for me in particular. It seems like there's a flavor of... Oh, I yeah. Come up with a different word besides self help. But there's a different flavor of self help here that makes me want to read it. And it, it makes oh, it thank stick you. for me. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So, okay. I do have one final logistical yeah. question, but it's an sure. important one, which is where can people go to find out more about you, connect with you, and buy the book? Oh, yeah. This detail. Yes. Um, well, <laughs> I write a weekly newsletter, a weekly self-care newsletter that, you know, I feel like I'm the worst motivational speaker and writer around because I'm like, step one is this is going to be hard. And this is going to take a long time. It's going to take like, actually, the amount of time it's going to take is your whole life. And we can make that journey meaningful, enjoyable, um, something that connects you to others rather than isolates you. And so it's not like when I'm not writing a book, I'm not constantly doing this work. So if you want to join me on kind of like an evolving conversation, um, you can sign up for my newsletter, which is taraschuster.com slash newsletter, or you can text the word GLOW, G-L-O-W, to 66866. Um, just give it a text. You'll join the newsletter. It comes out every Friday. And then the other place where I'm most active is Instagram, um, which I'm just trying to make not hellish. Like, I don't know if my account's good, but I do know it's not hellish. And I, I do know that um, my intention is to create a positive space that is also not um, full of toxic positivity and mm -hmm you know, me needing to look one way or another. And then my books are available wherever books are sold. Um, I recommend buying it from your local indie bookstore, either of them, and you can pre-order Glow in the Fucking Dark now, which is a big help to me and getting the message of the book out there. So those are the places. Ah, wonderful. Thank you so much, Tara. I really appreciate your time. And I'll make sure all these links get into our show notes so that awesome. people can just look below and click yeah. the links and, and get on the newsletter. Well, thank you for having me. It's been such a pleasure. Yeah, likewise. Thank you so much for listening to the Radically Loved Podcast. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on Facebook at Radically Loved Rosie, on Instagram at Rosie Acosta, and Twitter at Rosie Acosta. By the way, this is original music by DJ Taz Rashid. You can follow DJ Taz on Spotify and check out the best music for yoga and meditation. This has been a Mod Pod Studio production. Check them out at www.modpodstudio.com.